How's it going? How's it going? Hard Talk Radio. I'm your host, Mr. Dead Man. And with us tonight is PD Aliva. How's it going? I'm doing all right, man. Doing all right. Oh, by the way, a quick announcement. This show is sponsored, not sponsored. Well, I guess you could say it is by, uh, <clears throat> let me check out, guys, you need to check out this book. If you like crazy teens going psycho with guns and looking for blood, you got to check out Mr. Dead Man Made Me Do It. All right. This is a short anthology with a handful of short stories that when apparently when people read them, they go psycho. They go crazy. I don't know what it is. Okay, they read stories, I guess, with my name in it somehow. Somehow I'm a character. I don't get it. But it makes people go insane. All right? So check it out. On Amazon, paperback book, or paperback book. Redundant. Paperback, ebook. So we've been writing for a while there. I mean, and, and, and why, yeah. though? Like, what was what's the passion for, for uh, telling stories? Like, what, what is the reason for that? I mean, it seems like such a mm-hmm. lonesome hobby, you know? Or a lonesome uh, craft. Uh, understood understood it's like the only thing that really gets my gut and satisfies whatever dark side or human um psyche that exists within me i gotta tell stories i gotta get it out um i love the characters i love the way they build in my mind it's like it's like living in an altered reality or a different dimension and i quite enjoy living there and staying there it's where my friends are oh wow that's pretty cool now what about um i mean but why horror? Why horror? All right. So probably has a lot to do with growing up, you know, my youth. My dad showed me a lot of horror films at a very young age. So it kind of got desensitized rather quickly there. Yeah. But also I love the the human psyche, the, the dark side of the human condition and how far we could like really stretch those limits. And where I came from, my house was kind of inner turmoil type of house so i used literature to kind of like escape it was my escape and a lot of it was darkness so trying to i guess a child trying to make light of you know understand what's going on around him yeah horror kind of um tends to stroke those feathers that's interesting i mean it, it, there's something about horror that, that really does that right i mean like it challenges you like it's uh, yeah. you have to face your fears Exactly. It's like that, that part of us that nobody, um, nobody reveals, you know, out in the open. It's that part of us that we, we keep hidden from other people. You know, we cover it with secrets, throw it in the, you know, back of a closet and kind of keep it there. We don't want to show anybody or let anybody know these are dirty little thoughts or dirty little secrets about ourselves. So it's like that dark side. And when you're writing hard, you're able to pull that out as much as you want and just let it go. Mm. You know? Now, are there certain aspects of horror that really uh, grab you, though? I mean, uh, yeah, there's the, uh, there's the, yeah, we want to shatter their, their sense of comfort. We want to make them feel fear. But that's right. Are there elements like, uh, like paranormal or more monster, maybe more uh, uh, psychological? I'm, I'm definitely more of a psychological person, and def- also on top of that, more of the, the supernatural, metaphysical. Um, but, I mean, considering I've been a therapist for such a long period of time, that psychological portion is huge for me. It's like one of the biggest part. I like to be, I don't just like to write about my characters. I want to be inside their head. I like to be in there and have all of their thoughts and all of their emotions and their intentions too and belief systems and really get in there so I can get in. It's like kind of like being a method actor. You know, I'm like a method writer. I like to be in my characters. I like know them more than more than they even know themselves, know where they're going to go. So definitely on the psychological. Oh, wow. I that's, dig it. I like that. I like that a lot. That's very cool. It's like, like you go in there and you kind of, you like, you like to mess with them, you know? That's right. That's right. See how they're ticket. You know, it's um like the last few novels that I've written, they have been through multiple point of views and this new one, um, the Rose that has, you're in the point of view of alien vampires. You're in the point of view of gray aliens. You're, you're in the point of view of the, the rebel freedom fighters and all the rogue soldiers and everybody else that's there. It's multiple point of view. So I really got to get into that mindset. You know, what is an alien vampire thinking, you know? Mm. So I did uh, get that stretch. They're, they're obviously bloodthirsty, but then I wanted them to be not just um, 
I didn't want my vampires to be those morons that are just, you know, bloodthirsty and that's all they think about. I want them to be intelligent. I want them to be sophisticated. And it's like, you know, I'm watching shows like Ancient Aliens. I'm getting into that and I love vampires. And it's like, wow, you know, if aliens do exist, then maybe it would make sense that they would be vampires. You know, not all aliens have to look like gray aliens, you know. So right. maybe there's a, a race of aliens out there that are vampires. When they come to this planet, they can't live under the sun due to some chemical reaction, which is what I made the alien vampires. They have to live underground. They can only live on on human blood on this planet. Mm. So it made sense. And then make them primal, make them but make them sophisticated and intelligent. You know, have give them emotions and give them like real depth and lore to them. I like that. I like that. Yeah. I like intergalactic psychic. Alien vampires. Yeah, definitely. Bring it on, you know. Intergalactic um, Draculas, man. There there you go. There you go. Yeah. That's cool. Let's, let's, right. let's delve. Let's go deep into that book right there. Uh, the Rose. So The Rose. Yes. Yeah. That's dystopian science fiction. It takes place <laughs> right after World War Three. So in the book, the beginning, you find out that World War Three has been waging for about 10 years. And... Uh, a couple years ago in America, they sent all their citizens into safety camps. And what happens is the war ends, the treaty is signed. Pretty much America has lost World War III to the Chinese and Russian soldiers. And what happens is in these safety camps then turn into reprogramming camps. And they're trying to reprogram Wait, the human population. we lost to China and Russia? <laughs> yeah, we lose. We oh, do. Man. We do. We do. So, although it's a treaty, it's supposed to, you know, it's all about peace and stuff like that. But immediately um, they start subjugating the American population and doing genetic experiments, experiments on them. And that's when this safety camp survivor, her name is Sandy Cox, gets rescued by this guy named Phil, who's part of this underground, like mysterious human rebellion. And they get captured and she's taken into this underground complex where she discovers that alien vampires are there gray aliens are there and the gray aliens are just as vicious as the alien vampires they come as a surprise in the book and when she's in there they do some genetic experiments on her and this guy phil is, has to go in there to rescue her and take her out of there so he's trying to she's part of the rebellion and he's trying to get her to atlanta to train under his master leader of the rebellion robin winter oh wow and, what she discovers is that elite humans, so all the humans in charge, all the powerful humans have conspired with these alien vampires and gray aliens to turn the human population into zombies by using a pharmaceutical that destroys gray matter in the brain and the frontal lobe. So that is what they're doing because that'll allow them to have not only planetary domination, but interstellar domination as well. So the book, it's a series, about seven books, and you'll discover more of that over the course of the series. Oh, man, that's a pretty cool concept right there. I like that. I like that. Not bad, right? And the alien, the um, alien vampires, they live in hollow earth. So we got the whole hollow earth, middle earth theory going on. And at the end of the book, this one, you actually see hollow earth. They go into, they're called Drox, right? So Drox okay. are the alien vampires, and they go into the Drox city and everything. And you get a little bit of a glimpse, and it's going to be wild because that's where book two takes on. Oh, that's you pretty cool. That's a lot cool. of hollow earth. So there's hollow earth here. Okay. Yeah. And there's, I guess, alien colonies inside the earth. Uh, Correct. Are there like ancient ruins inside the earth as well? There will be. Uh, when we get in there, when I'm, because I'm starting to write book two, and my thing is, all right, what does this underground hollow earth city look like? You know, and, uh, my first thought was, all right, let's say Tesla, right, had his way. And we were living in a Tesla world. What would our world look like? Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm, I'm kind of putting into that hollow earth city. It's going to be more like a, a Tesla run city, you know, um, you know, unlimited power. Um, but what is it? Anti-gravity vessels and machines, you know, taking them everywhere and um, transportation and stuff like that. It's going to be a wild, like futuristic city underneath the earth. Oh, that's pretty cool. Man, that's that's pretty wild, man. Like, of I'd course, say there's like, no limits to the imagination, right? Keep going, right? Man, all sorts of colonies. They would colonize it. Oh, man, 
And in, in the way your uh, your your vampire alien species is uh, taking over humanity, wiping us out, this is pretty wild too. Yeah. Where, where did you? Uh, I mean, what was the inspiration for that? Was it a, a lot of sci-fi? Definitely a lot of sci-fi. I've seen um, there used to be this science fiction show called Buck Rogers. I think it's the 25th century. Buck Rogers, right? It was this cheesy, like late 70s, early 80s show. So I'm probably like four, four years old, right? And in part one of the episodes, they had an alien vampire, right? And he, right. he looked like the old Nosferatu, right? He looked like that. Mm -hmm. And I remember probably four years old, probably shitting a brick, right? Watching this this episode. And it stayed with me forever. So that uh, alien vampire thought process was there like from a very early age. And then as I got older, I was like, you know, I would definitely want to write a novel that has alien vampires. And then I got into theories like ancient aliens. And of course, I've always been a vampire fan, you know, so let's let's mold these these together and see what we can come up with. And in the in the book, these Drox, these alien vampires, so they're genetic hybrids between reptilian aliens and cobra snakes. And Ooh. they've been genetically modified and now they're living on Earth, and they're just they're bloodthirsty, primal and bloodthirsty, but highly intelligent as well. So, what reptilian aliens mated with cobra snakes? So they have like the cobra venom too. It's like they don't have the venom, all right, but they're it's like a genetic hybrid, all right. So they use genetic experimentation to uh, create this new species. Wait, can they also be hypnotized by like the like a flute? <laughs> they not by the flu, no. Oh, they man. can't be hypnotized. That could be like their weakness. So, so like Phil discovers, <laughs> wait a second, if I just play a flute a certain way, they, these these aliens they they uh they start dancing, start can hypnotize. They're swaying. <laughs> I got him under my uh, under the spell, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's too funny. Then then Phil controls him. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Uh, See where it goes. If right? Phil gets mad of power, he's like, now I control the army. I control the vampire army. Ah. <laughs> right. And power goes to the head, right? Right. Um, man, I like I like what you're doing with this. It's great. I like dystopian novels. I mean, they're fun. They are fun. They're definitely fun. It's like, where's your imagination going? You mm -hmm. know, what's your take on how, you know, the human race is going to subjugate themselves? <laughs> yeah. Pretty much, right? Yeah. So, could happen at any minute. Right, right. I mean, it's like, yeah, it's the end of the world scenario. It's uh, after the apocalypse. It's it, it's in the ruins. It's after the fallout. It's uh, it's fun stuff. I talked to this one guy at, at, at the, what's it, Mag, uh, man, Mangum. His name's Mangum. His book is a uh, Extinction Peak. Dinosaurs. It's a dystopian novel of dinosaurs. They come out from the nice. hollow earth. I was like dinosaurs. I haven't heard of heard of I have not heard of that. You know, badass. I like it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Right, it's pretty cool. I was like, all right, that's that's nice. Now you're into. Yeah, I, I love new concepts. You know, new. Yeah. Um, it's like let's take you know let's take old ideas and kind of make them evolve at this point. You know, right. You know, let's just not do the same thing time and time again. Let's you know let's make the myths. You know, make mm -hmm. new myths, put new twist on you know old tropes. Let's go. You yeah, know, we're, let's do that. We're better than that. Let the imagination run out there. You know, it's like when I write a horror novel, I feel like I just cut open my skull, opened it up, and let all the demons just run out. Let the imagination run wild. Man, that's the best way to be. That's Stretch how it, it be. out. That's how it should be, right? I mean, that's uh, that's also kind of, I don't know. So, wait, when you write a hard novel, are you, uh, is part of you getting in there, like like some deep-seated issues getting in there? <laughs> I think we all got some deep-seated issues, but... Hey, listen, I'll be honest. I put everything in there. You know, what are those little dark secrets? I once wrote a, um, an article. The question was, why do I write horror? And I, my first line was, I write it because I, I, can't, <laughs> I can't go around killing people. <laughs> well, that's it in a book, right? You I know, mean, sometimes it, people just piss you off so much sometimes. Like you just want to pick up an axe and start hacking away, but you're not right. going to do that. You don't want to then put you in jail and throw away the key. I do like freedom too, you know? So put it in a book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can I mean, kill there's... as many people as I want. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the limitations, man. Limitations. One, let's just <laughs> right? run around with the chainsaws and go crazy. Dang it! Damn it! 
I, that's right. Yeah, you know, run that, a muck. That's kind of like the cliche too. I write hard because I've, uh, you know, pent up demons inside. You know. Yeah. Oh, uh, reflection. I love the psychology of it. So it's like um, one of the I I think one of the most iconic villains. And maybe it's not horror. It, it is horror, like a super. Well, no, not supernatural. Well. Silence of the Lambs, right? Hannibal Lecter is one of the most iconic villains in book and movie history. You know, absolutely cerebral awesome. That That's like the depths of darkness that the human existence reaches is exactly what that guy was doing. You know, cutting people up and eating them. Mm-hmm. That takes it to the next level. Serial killer wise, if you think about it, it's not a lot of serial killers that are eating their victims. I mean, Jeffrey Dahmer, that's who we have, right? Right. You know. That um, even crossing that line as a serial killer, you know, that says something. The depths of control, you know, he thinks that he's a god of because of what he's doing. Like it's his right to be eating these people, and that character is just completely iconic. I hope that one day I'm able to create a character like as that iconic. Oh, you're definitely on the path for. It. I mean, these uh, intergalactic Dracula vampire things are pretty cool sounding. I hope so. I, I hope mean, so. I, Sanos is in there. That's the main guy in there. Sanos. Uh, main alien vampire. Sanos. And one um one other author gave me a review that says Sanos is the villain you love to hate. And I absolutely love that. Oh, that's he nice. is awesome. <laughs> you know, he's just so primal. And he he's an anarchist. You know, he doesn't like that his his people, his species has formed this alliance with humans because he sees them as food. So he's kind of like the anarchist in his own, um, among his own people, thinking that he's doing the right things, saying we shouldn't be with them because they're our food. You know, we're, we're above them. Why are we doing anything with them? And um, that's my Sonos. And then the, my other horror novels, the Gollum, uh, when I wrote Gollum, and that should be coming out soon, sometime next year. Gollum is just, he is that that Hannibal Lecter, like, slash Joker type of character. Just completely anarchal and completely just evil to the core, put it that way. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and they can't resist mingling with the humans because, uh, I don't know, that, that thick, T-H-I-C-C thickness. Huh? Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure not even they can resist that. I see a thick back. Like, hey, what's up? We're yeah. addictive to them. Yeah. 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 You know? Hey, so what is, what you got a favorite dystopian? It doesn't have to be horror. It could be a favorite dystopian film. It could even be action, it's like Demolition fun. Man. <laughs> ah, that's so funny. Dem- <laughs> Demolition Man is a good movie, though. Um, I like more like Blade Runner, but I'll tell you, my I Am Legend is my favorite book, dystopian book. I mean, I, absolutely phenomenal book um good book movies yeah definitely not... they screwed it up man they screwed that movie up it was you know i could kind of understand you want to update it you want to put a little you know cgi in there so i kind of you know that's all right i understand that but when you completely just switch the ending up like that that i did not like don't do that the ending in that book is iconic it's what makes the book you know mm-hmm. uh, and you just screwed it up <laughs> Completely went the opposite direction on that, and right. that I did not like. You know, it's like you ruined a great movie. Why did you change it? And I heard that they changed it because they did. Um, you know, people who don't read the book, so they did their little um, experiment where you know they get people to watch it and they get their feedback and stuff. And people mm-hmm. didn't like the ending because of what it was. But I'm like, I think it would have been even more iconic if right. they had done it the right way. You know, right? I mean, it was cool to see Will Smith. You know. Do his mm-hmm. thing. I mean, the, the dog scene, I like even that movie, even though it's not as good as the book, it still has some moments where it was like impactful, like the, the dog scene. The dog scene is what gets you. Yeah. Man, he, he loved his dog. He did love his dog. That That's he did. the only thing, only connection he really had. And once that was gone, it was yeah. over. Yeah, he was gone. Well. And that's a good pick. That is a good pick right there. Yeah, yeah, it is one of my favorites. So, yeah, I read it a long time ago, too. I read, you know, most every other one, you know, that's out there. Fahrenheit is out there. Mm-hmm. Atlas Shrugged. 
you know, Brave New World. Brave I New mean, World, yeah. that's one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's all good, right? You know, it's and those are more like, you know, your cautionary type of dystopian tales in a way, you know? Yeah. This is where you're going, you know? You guys are did, screwed type of thing, you did know? You, but, uh, did, you, did you see what was trending on Twitter today? I did not. I did not. The Great Reset. What is it? What is the Great Reset? I do not know. What is, is it, the Great Reset? It sounds like, like cons conspiracy theory, except... Okay. Um, these these I guess world uh, economists get together and they come up with this plan, conniving plan to recreate society by 2030, where we don't own anything. There's no property. There's just uh, you rent things, and um, I that alone I cannot fathom because <laughs> so everything you have you're renting. They they have because that means someone has to own it. <laughs> If you're renting it, someone owns it. Was the government? Somebody own it? definitely owns it. The corporation. They probably do. <laughs> Here we go. Right, headed towards dystopia right away. Right, right. You I, you can't own anything. It's ours. You are only allowed it to get it from us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is gonna be a better world. They say. I know. When world leaders, for them. when world leaders and economists get together with billionaires and corporations to create a better society. Guys, that's a warning sign that things are about to go south. Uh, you know. Exactly. <laughs> Read any dystopian novel or watch any dystopian book, and that's exactly what they're telling you mm -hmm. not to go, not to do, you know, not yeah. to conform to. It's they, amazing. They, they might strive for a brave new world or a demolition man, but what they're going to yeah. get is demolition man and uh, Fahrenheit or, or, or uh, uh, 1984. That's what they're going to get. All right. That's, that's right. right. That's right. And they might get Death Race 2000. That would be Death fun. I, I, that would be fun. You know, right? you know I, I think about this. Some of the dystopian films seem kind of fun, actually. I keep on mentioning Demolition Man because living sub subterranean seemed like it wouldn't be too bad. I mean, you eat rat burgers and have beer. I'll, I'll take the That's beer. That's right. Right. Anytime. Death Race 2000. I'll give it a shot. I played Twisted Metal. Which is Metal. funny. It's Stallone's in both of those. He's in <laughs> Death Race 2000, the original, and then he's in Demolition Man. He's also in I Judge love Dredd. Him. And he's in Judge Dredd. That's right. He likes dystopia. <laughs> yes, yes. Death Race 2000 is one of those classic movies when they run that guy's head over, right? And it's like mm -hmm. you just see a, a water. It's like a watermelon. Just put a watermelon there. <laughs> like that. Absolutely classic, man. Mm -hmm. You gotta love what you know the depths that they went to to just make a movie back then. It's classic. Right. It's a lot of fun. I mean, they're just ex willing to explore any any sort of concept, really. You think about yeah. it. Yeah, pretty wild. I mean, That's right. the creativity was was flowing. I mean, now it's just reboots and remakes and no originality. You know, it's like, come on, man, can't you do something? Yeah, I mean, what's more original? The, the Toxic Avenger. Did you ever see the Toxic Avenger? Oh hell yeah, Classic. dude! Oh yeah, that's not even a B-rated movie; it's a C-rated movie. So yeah, bad, I still like it. so I still bad. Love it. <laughs> but classic, exactly classic. Killer clowns from outer space, like mm -hmm. all those those B-rated movies. They they put their all into it. It was like they got into it. They they got into the makeup, the cinematography, every little part about it. Well, you don't have a budget. You don't have a budget, but you do what you got to do. And they came out. They made iconic movies, classic movies. Right. Now, let me ask you this. Would you rather watch uh, Killer Clowns from Outer Space or the reboot of The Exorcist, which is going to be real? I am definitely an Exorcist fan. So, I mean, I love my Killer Clowns, but I'll probably go with uh, some Exorcist there. Man, you're going to yeah. Man, I don't know. If they, they're actually remaking The Exorcist for 2020 or what, 2021, 2020, yeah, 2021. Yeah. It's like, no way. No way, it, man. Is it a movie or is it a, a show? I heard that it was supposed to be like a show or a mini series or something like that. Well, I heard it was a movie, but then again, I heard some things that sound like it was uh, pulled back. So I don't know. I don't know. Gotcha. Like Danny Trejo was going to be in it or something. Uh, the dude from uh, Machete. <laughs> yes. Uh, if that's the case, I want him to play the priest. <laughs> that's too funny, dude. He could pull it off. He could go priest. Yeah, he could. He could. Yeah. I mean, he was in Spy Kids, so he could definitely pull it off. Right. Mm. Okay, so let's get back to the rose. First off, where can people buy it? Of course, Amazon, but like, 
Uh, for any major retailer, it's, a, it's across the board. So you go to Barnes & Noble, you could go to Books A Million, you go to, I think it's called Indigo. I mean, wherever it is, you can find it. You can go to pdaliva.com and you just go to, that's my website, and you'll find it there and it'll have all the links to every retailer that's there. Nice, nice. Cool. And it's um, ebook, paperback, and hardcover. I'm a hardcover fan, so I had to do a hardcover. Audiobook, hopefully soon. Now, what were some of the major uh, hurdles and obstacles you had to get through on, on this book? Okay. I think the biggest hurdle that I had to overcome was, number one, it's a series. And I'm putting little um, tidbits in there throughout the series that are kind of go with some ancient alien theories, right? So I had to make sure when my fellow ancient alien fans are reading this novel – and they're like, wow, that's, you know, Robert Morningstar. That's that could could be 12th planet, you know, theory or, you know, this could be Akashic record. You know, what is this? You know, and I'm throwing little Easter eggs in this first book. They're going to manifest throughout the series. So I had to get those right uh, to make sure that they were they were planted at the right place and that they they were perfect. So when somebody who is a fan can see them, they'll recognize them. And I think that was the hardest part, that like little attention to detail and making sure I, I had those theories right. Because ancient alien theorists are very um, fanatical about their theories, too. Man. Yeah, I'm curious. I'm, I'm curious now. Uh, uh, what is the 12th planet theory? Okay, so there was a 12th planet. There is a, um asteroid belt like outside of Mars. And some one of the theories is that that was a planet. All right. That was one of the planets that was inhabited. What happened is that planet and there's another theory and Mars were at war. And that's why Mars is what it was. There was a nuclear explosion on there and the 12th planet was destroyed. Ah. Oh. All right. And that's why some people think that people from one of those planets, Mars, the 12th planet came to Earth. And that's where we came from. That's oh, how we wow. started. So, so does that explain like the pyramids and stuff? Ah, does that one theory can? I mean, it can. You could lead it there. You know, with the with the pyramids, there's a lot of theories on that with other planets, like especially with Orion's belt and how that came to be. And, you know, then there's portals and how they get here and they get here, could get here quickly. And it's like um, it's like a beam, like a portal here. Those pyramids and stuff can bring people in from other planets from across the universe. It, the way it's set up or whatever, which has changed in time since that time. And that's why some people say it doesn't work anymore. Weird. Kind of like a, I, man, I've heard some crazy theories that like the, the pyramids were not actually tombs, but were designed to be power plants. Power plants. Yes. That's the word I was looking for. And like the theory behind that is that there's not, well, yeah, there was a Pharaoh, a Pharaoh buried inside. It's not, just that there's more to it than that there's little spaces little rooms and there's like this um mm -hmm. i don't like a like a trench kind of that leads to i don't know i don't know if it leads to other pyramids or whatever it just it just seems kind of a little too weird for it just be a tomb you know yeah like if you're but an unexplained phenomenon in there yeah like what was the purpose of this room you know, right. well, why do they have it? Why is it set up like this? Why, you know, why is it, um, you know, why is it made of whatever material it's made of? You know, what are all these questions? Like, what were they thinking? This is thousands and thousands of years old. What was the thought process of making this back then? You know, and then, of course, the biggest question is, how did they create these damn pyramids? You know, living 10,000 right? years ago. How because, did you make these things? Because the stuff I heard when I was in school was a damn lie. A bunch of slaves, a bunch of he Hebrew slaves. I I don't think so, man. Not not just. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about moving stone. That's a lot of yes. A shit ton of manpower. Putting that together, mm. manpower, and then just the craftsmanship. Yeah, you know, they say that it's um, uh, you know, the creases or whatever are so thin. It's like paper thin in there. So that mm -hmm. precision and perfection. All right, where's this masonry coming? And knowledge coming from ten thousand years ago. You know, so it makes sense, you know, put it this way. Anybody who wants to put a theory behind anything can pretty much come up with some sort of proof to prove their theory if they want to prove their theory. You know, you, you can say anything you want at that point, put a label on it, you know, screw it in the way that you want to see it or have it be seen and say that's proof that this exists. So mm. the, only, the only thing I know is I don't know anything.
Hey, you know more than I do on this, but I like that you use this ancient alien stuff then tied in with a, with a vampire alien force. It's very cool. You know, when I hear Alex Jones say intergalactic vampires, I you you, you created one, and that's pretty cool. Correct. Um, now, what about the vampire part? I mean, like, are we talking about, like, was that, like, like Vlad the, the, the Impeller sort of vampire? Is it like a Dracula sort of thing? Is it? Suck. It sounds like it is kind of like that, like like sucking blood, like using fangs and stuff. What what, what are we talking about? They're definitely sucking blood. <laughs> they're definitely they definitely have fangs and they're definitely um, drawing in some blood for some necks. Uh, they also like um, ripping out hearts sometimes too and nice. eating them. So, yeah, definitely. I don't know for some reason I'm into this pulling out hearts and eating them in my novels lately. It's like we got a lot of hearts out there, um, <laughs> a lot of bleeding hearts. Was your favorite Indiana Jones film Temple of Doom? Ah, uh, my favorite one is actually The Last Crusade, but I do love Temple of Doom. I thought you were going to say Classic. Crystal Skull. No, th- <laughs> no, nah, nah, nah. Last Crusade, but come on. I mean, whew, Temple of Doom is classic. I actually, what's funny, I watched that like a couple of weeks ago with my now boys, and they're nine. And then when he goes to get that hard, I say, you guys might not want to watch this one. You know, they're a little squeamish. So, oh, man. But uh, that one was they wild. got through it. That... It was, right? You didn't expect that. And then the heart's burning in his hand when the guy's body is burning. I mean, after uh, Raiders, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, yeah, Temple of Doom is like a freak show. It's like, what's going on? Everything, what they eat and everything is like, what is going on? You guys are trying to gross me out. What is this? That's probably what they, yeah, they're eating the snakes, the monkey brains. Chill, the monkey brains. The dessert. It's called eyeball soup, too. Yeah. Oh, man. Okay, so what about the... Uh, well, I... So if your vampires come from space, do they ever, like, interact with... Like other vampires that aren't like space vampires? They do not. Okay. Not at this point. No. It's all them living in Middle Earth from other planets. They're um the draconian reptiles are their like masters and their lords who are not on this planet at this point. And but they do interact with other alien species, which you'll see more of in different installments as well. Kind of introduce a few new species per um per book. So oh, in this cool. one, you got we got werewolves in here. In the werewolves, book. werewolves. So which are pets for the vampires, right? And then uh, we have something called the thorks. The thorks are like these big cricket-looking things, and um, they're kind of like soldiers. Kind of like, if you ever seen Star Wars, so the uh, the droid army, like they're, they're kind of the droid army for okay. alien vampires. And um, the way they eat is phenomenal. I can't tell you, but the way they eat is phenomenal. You just got to read it to find out. Like a swarm of locusts or something? Nah, more like, I think Jeff Goldblum, the fly. Oh, okay. really gross. Uh, (laughs) So it's badass, so. That's nasty. That's real nasty. Yeah, that's good. I like that. Yeah. Hmm. Now, I wonder, like, because even on this show, I've spoken with some real life vampires. At least they claim to be real life vampires. Uh, they could just they be humans exist. larping. Like in your in your book, is there ever going to be? I don't know if it's it's current in this one. Uh, humans that pretend to be like one of these intergalactic vampires, or they pretend to be, or maybe they're like Pret- a cult and they worship them or something. No, pretending to be no, 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 not doing that. Not okay. yet. Maybe we'll see, but no. So far, the thought I have for um, the, the Rose Part 2 is you're going to see the vampires, obviously. You're going to be in Hollow Earth. You're going to be down there. You're going to be in their city. And I'm trying to think, all right, so how are they interacting? You know, I'm thinking that they have, like, they're raising humans. Like, we raise cattle or something like that, you know? Mm. And um, and kind of, like, feeding off of that type of thing. You know, where do all these missing children go, right? They're in the during the year they get kidnapped maybe they're ending up in hollow earth and they're food for these vampires you know that's how they're surviving so they don't have to come up all the time and then maybe um vampires in the past like dracula and stuff like that are based on alien vampires that did go up there you know kind of just scared human beings you know so we could definitely get a lot fun with it put it that way 
That sounds pretty wild. Epstein Island was harvesting kids to keep these vampires at bay, guys. There you go. There you go. <laughs> hey, dude, you never know. You uh, never know. Okay, so <clears throat> let's get into, we talk about the rows, and let's get into why, you know, what, what, what grinds your gears on the writing scene? Anything that grinds your gears on the writing scene, publishing scene, or horror? Uh, not too much. You know, it's like, um, I'm the type of guy, I take it as it comes, you know, people write what they want. What I do notice a lot with some works of traditional publishing, it seems like it's always the same exact story, you know, type of your murder mystery type of story. And there's no like depth of change. This is why I like, I like writers like, um, Blake Crouch, right? He wrote some great novels, like Kind of like the novels that I read, I'm like, I need to step up my game because this guy just upped the bar. Um, a book called Dark Matter, absolutely phenomenal, which was about um, alternate universes and alternate realities. Absolutely phenomenal book. And then his newest book, Recursion, uh, which is about time travel, but it's also about, and this was fascinating to me, it was about um, like the power of memories and time traveling through memories. Oh, wow. Absolutely phenomenal. So they created this machine. What they do is your um, whatever memory you want to go back into time with, they um, put you in this this big canister, right? And they initiate a chemical in your brain that takes you into that that memory, and you wake up in that memory, and you start life over from that memory. I mean, badass, awesome concept. Like I like Ooh, that. Wow, that concept, dude. That could yeah, that's a phenomenal. mind bender right there because if if that concept is a, is a reality and pretend that it is, that means if everyone did that, everyone would be in their own time, right? Yeah. That they would and changing time and continuing to change time. And that's fascinating that you said that because uh, a lot of the book gets into that as the book continues to go. And then, you know, all of a sudden other governments have that find his technology and it just, it, keeps going it gets just wild and wild but i like that that kind of like intelligent off the cuff you know um obviously he's into books like about with like quantum physics and alternate universes and stuff like that and i find that stuff fascinating myself you know so i like that type of writer um other people jd barker has been fascinating even like v schwab with her mm -hmm. vicious and vengeful uh, though uh, those books absolutely blew me away she did such a good job and i like to read her new one so and then when i go to horror obviously you know stephen king but i don't know stephen king is um his books have been all right you know i think the institute has is his best book that he's written in like 20 years Dr. Sleep, I was highly disappointed with um, The Outsider, too. It's like, all right, it's kind of more of the same, you know, mm. in, in his case, it's the supernatural being that's out there that's killing people. And then these people are trying to, you know, hunt them down, and kill them or, you know, yeah. stop them from doing what they're doing. It's like, all right, it's been done a gazillion times. But of course, I'm going to read Stephen King when he comes out because he is the king. Right. So and then John Connolly. John Connolly's Charlie Parker series, definitely I'm a 100% fan of. Absolutely phenomenal. He's, that's more supernatural thriller horror, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, he's got some gruesome stuff in there. That guy's imagination definitely goes through a dark place. So, but definitely like the Charlie Parker series by him. I Fascinating like stuff. So, yeah, it, it sounds like you really, I mean, I mean, you're definitely really aware of a lot of talent out there. Um, and, and you also seem to have a pretty good disposition on, uh, as, you know, being an indie writer. Um, seem to not have because I I, I don't know what, what is it about. I mean, because you you are independent. You don't have to worry about yes. a publisher telling you what you need to write or an editor telling you what you need to write. I mean, I guess I'll tell you what you need to change. I suppose depending on what your editor is, or who they are. But of course, but you have the freedom to create what you want. Um, and. Are you are you going through like self publishing means, or are you work with uh, like smaller publishers? I, I work with a small. Okay. Sure. Um, Quillen Birch Publishing. They're down here in Florida. Very very small traditional publishing press, um, and they're like, do whatever you want. You know, they're just starting out. They believe in the work. They love working with me. Well, we love working together. So it's like, do what you want. You know, and let's go. You know, let's get this started and let's see what we could do. You know. 
I always say I've read so many good indie published books too, like J.D. Barker, right? He was a indie publisher as well when he first started his book Forsaken, which is more about witches and stuff, was phenomenal. You know, um, Hugh Howley with Wolf, you know, those types of indie publishers did make it out there, you know? So indie publishing pumps out great books. It's an industry that reminds me of um, the pulp fiction literary era that took place from like the 19, the early 1900s, to the 1950s, um, magazines like Weird Tales, mm. you know, um, Amazing Adventures, stuff like that, where you had all these writers just pumping out so many novels or so many books and short stories like ever on once a month basis. And that reminds me, it's kind of reflective of what's going on now with indie publishing. Right. Uh, right. You look at it too, you know, it's all erotica and fantasy and science fiction and horror and dark fiction. And that's what all these pulp fiction magazines were back then. Right. And it's, it's, a, it's escapist literature. It's like, it, Getting out of your head. Life is freaking crazy out there, you know? This yeah. is the third dimensional reality and it sucks. So I'd rather put my head in a book and forget about this crap for a little bit of time and just go to a different friggin' planet, different world. Right, you right. Man, you're right about that. I could totally see the parallels there. Uh, because back in those days, back in that time, it was a bunch of, um, you had your pulp crime fiction, your, your vampires, yeah. you get your, your, uh, erotica stuff. I mean, it, it got to a point to where even the comic scene, you know, like how you mentioned weird tales and stuff, even the comic books, it was because of horror comic books that uh, the what the Comic Code Authority became a thing because it was like the government was wanting to come in and like censor it and, and all that stuff. Yep. You know, well, the only thing you have to worry about right now is um, Amazon rejecting a book or a publisher being like, this might be too, too, too much. But uh, yeah, so far... Well, every now and then I might hear something about a book being, um, you know, I guess rejected or blocked from, from Amazon. There's still some backdoor ways to get it in, you know, and there's other ways to, to, to get it out there if, if your book is that raunchy, you I know, mean, that crazy. But That there is. And usually people like a raunchy book. They do, so, they do man. You know, if they find out that it's been um, banned by Amazon, people are going to buy it. You could sell it over your website. You could go to – um. Yeah. You get a book funnel. You go to book funnel and you could kind of sell like over their app. You know, you could sell it and email it directly to them through book funnel and they take care of all that stuff. So if you got a raunchy book, put it out there. It deserves to be told anyway. And I've heard stories where like, let's say someone went through KDP to like self-publish or whatever and the book was blocked because of a erotica content. Yeah. Uh, I guess maybe they used the wrong words or something. But they went through another service like Lulu or, or Ingram Spark, whatever, and used their distribution services that they have and bam, it pops up again on Amazon. But now it's not yes. blocked. <laughs> it's like, that's but, right. But the substance, the content didn't change. It was just, it didn't go past the gatekeeper or the screeners or whatever. It's, you know, yep. I'm just say screen through it. Um, yeah. When you do it through KDP, I do through Ingram Spark and Amazon. So I have my books on Amazon specifically with them, but then I use um, Ingram Spark for Barnes and Noble and everybody else. Mm-hmm. And for those uh, wanting to know about that that particular book, I think it was a it was a erotica book, but um, I think they used the R word, uh, which in erotica you're. I, I get that there's a there's a rape fan. I just said it, <laughs> a rape fantasy <laughs> component, and some some chicks are into that, and some dudes are into that. Fine, whatever. If that's your thing, whatever is consensual. It's fantasy. It's all fantasy, you know. Um, fine, but you know Amazon has a problem with it. If you go through the KDP, but if you go through something else. Boom, it pops up. Yeah. So, you know. Probably because they don't have the liability anymore. Right. <laughs> From probably. a third party. All about liability. You gotta yeah. love it. You know, speaking of uh, edgy content, um, now, Rose and our, all, all your other stories, have has there been a work that you worked on that really pushed you on, like, the substance yeah. and the content? Gollum. Gollum. Gollum is the egg. Yeah, Gollum does something to you. Um, it's like evil personified. You know, you're reading this book and it's um, it goes to it takes you to a place where when it's over, you're like, wow. Probably thinking everybody in the entire world is evil and you have to you know, protect yourself from every single person that's out there. But I gave it to my publisher when it was first done. 
she was first because it's a time piece, right? So it takes place in late 1940s, early 1950s, New York. So she was just doing the run through to make sure that, you know, I was getting the time frame right as far as, you know, um, you know, do they have phones? What are the, what are the phones look like in 1951? You know, um, how do they make a phone? Like, like little pieces like that, you know, and she read through it and she, in order to do that, she had to read the whole thing straight through. And she's like, talked to me a couple months later and she's, she's like, that book stayed with me. It took me like more than a few weeks to just shake it off. Cause it's so in depth, just evil right to the core. And especially with the way it ends, you're completely stumped. You know, it's not your typical um, ending to any book that's out there. So, and that took me, definitely took me to a limit where I was like, whew, you know, kind of getting wrapped up in this. I need to take, take a break from it. I don't need all that evil filth infecting my energy either, you know? So that took me to a level. And then as a response to that, I wrote the book that I'm writing now that I'm just about finished, which is called, it's, it's a horror thriller, but it pays homage. It's more like satire. And it's uh, kind of pays homage to the old um, um, cosmic horror and grindhouse novels or oh. grindhouse movies. Remember the grindhouse movies? Mm -hmm. So it's like completely like over the top. It's insane. It's been my COVID, you know, um, quarantine 2020, um, you know, um, just claustrophobic type of novel. And it's holy cow, it's 150,000 words. So it's a monster of a novel. And it takes wow. you from. It takes you everywhere. You even go into hell. You you got uh, people extracting fluid from other people's brains and drinking oh, it. Shit. <laughs> you got uh, um, but you got spiders. This girl gets um, kidnapped and they hold her captive and they give her this stuff to drink. And she's so thirsty she has to drink it. And what it is, it's all eggs, spider eggs. And oh. Spider eggs get birthed from her and come out of her stomach. And oh. then these spiders go into all these other people's ears and they infect their ears and they come out as demons. And it's just, I was like, holy cow, dude, what's wrong with me? You know, I gotta stop cool. here for a second, you know? It's like, but it's, it's not, Gollum is more like serious horror, you know, whereas Jiggly Spot is more like light, light horror with just some crazy freaking content. And when people read it, they're gonna be like, this guy has the greatest imagination that ever existed. So like, where the <laughs> hell did he come up with all this crap, dude? It's like, holy shit. Every time it just keeps escalating and escalating. And those characters in Jiggly Spot gave me some of the most difficult times. Like they fucked with me. This Jiggly Spot character fucked with me. It's like, uh, would, where am I going? <laughs> Sorry if I'm cursing. Oh, it's okay. So, no, no, no. Uh, like, yeah, you can cuss, you can cuss, it's fine. I would be like, uh, at a certain point, I would have to stop writing. I'm like, where is this going? I have no idea where this is going, you know? And I would take a couple of days off and all of a sudden, it's like the thought would just hit me exactly where it's going. And I would see Jiggly Spot. So Jiggly Spot, so you know, is um, a four foot, nine inch, right? Um, little guy who is a half man, half warlock. Okay. He does not like human beings. And he um, he's like the the lackey for these demons from another planet, right? And he has to get the the summer solstice um, cannibal indoctrination celebration going for these demons that are coming to Earth for this celebration. <laughs> and he's in charge of getting this done. And he's also, um, he moonlights, so he's a carnival worker and he's a clown, right? And that's his job in the carnival. So he's like this classic new clown. And, um, <laughs> this the stuff that this guy pulls. So when all of a sudden I would get the um, the glimpse of where the story is going, and I would feel this sort of sigh of relief. I would see Jiggly Spot's face, and he's smiling at me, like, "Yeah, I got you again." You know, this has been a eight, eight over an eight month um, battle of writing this novel and just getting it down, and all these characters just really just messing with me because they kept going in a different direction where in my head I thought they were going until I actually just had to give up and just let the fingers do the working, knowing that they're the ones who are writing the novel and I'm just actually on the ride. That's pretty wild, man. That's pretty cool. Is, is that is that your approach for, for all your stories? You just let the characters take hold and, and you go wherever they want to go? Yes, for the most part, definitely more with horror than I would say with the um, with the rose and the sun.
where it's like, I know where it's going, but yet they always just take you to another place anyway. But with the Rosa, because it's a series. So there's certain little um, little things that I need to make sure I capture in each book so the series makes sense and continues to escalate throughout. So I know more or less where they're going, although those surprises come up all the time. But with the horror, especially with Jiggly Spot, no. I just let him take over. That's pretty cool, man. I, I like that approach. It sounds like, like you'd even surprise yourself. I mean, if you just put everything as an outline, it seems yes. like it'd be kind of boring. But uh, I think so. I I love it when uh, the actual, the first draft is there in the creative process. It's like, all right, just let it go, you know, um, let it come out. Everything else is fine tuned in editing. And I love editing. That's like where architecture comes in. That's where, you know, it's like the artist, the painter who takes his painting and, you know, he gets into the, the little fine details, you know, he takes that tree and he puts, you know, blows it up and he does a little line here to make it look, you know, just fantastic to the uh -huh. eye. That's, that's the editing portion of it, that fine tuning, that it's like, tightening uh, it up. It's like Bob Ross and Happy Accidents, like that. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Always the Happy Accidents. Good old Bob Ross, right? Now, do you have a favorite horror movie? Uh, now, that's a big question. Yes, that it let's, is. That let's it go is. favorite genre first. You got you got a genre that uh, you really you really prefer. <sighs> A genre that I prefer, well, I would have to say that that would be more like slasher type of films, you know, yeah. especially with the resurrection of Michael Myers. I'm a uh, Michael Myers fan. Like Michael Myers was my hero when I was in high school. He was you your know? hero, huh? <laughs> he was, you know, it's uh, that's when part four or five came out, you know, and it was it was this huge thing. I think it was like 14, 15 years old. You know, Michael Myers was the shit. So I absolutely love Michael Myers. More than Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees, I'm a Michael Myers fan. Yeah, Freddy so, Krueger. Freddy Krueger's a, a wimp. He he can only kill you in your in your dreams. Uh, uh, Michael Myers he actually goes out and chases you. Well, Voorhees does too, right. but Voorhees has mommy issues. Michael Myers, he doesn't have yes. that. Michael Myers just wants to kill, dude. And yeah. I love it. I mean, the fact that an escaped mental patient, you know, right? like people <laughs> down and killing them, and it's, the concept is just absolutely classic, you know. So. Yeah, yeah, Halloween on that one. Like in the original, um, they just referred to him as they wanted to refer to him as just a figure. Like he's just darkness. He's just evil. He's yes. just coming after you. You know, he's not hung up on much of anything. He's just gonna come and kill you. Um, so you were rooting for him. You're like, yeah, yeah. finally go get that babysitter. <laughs> That's right, exactly. Especially with the new one. The new one I thought was phenomenal. They did a great job. I mean, the body count just kept coming, and that's where that's what you want to see, right? You want to see body counts of the yin yang in a, a new Halloween movie. So, and they definitely hit the hit the nail on the head. And I'm excited for the new one. And I was thinking too. So this is the new one they just came out with is a new sequel, right? Because in this yeah, timeline, they, they kind of restarted part two the timeline. never happened. So they yeah. start restarted it. So, so we have the original Halloween 2, right? Mm -hmm. And then we have um, Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. And now we have another Halloween 2, right? So <laughs> yeah. is that the first series that had like three part twos? And now is it going to have three part threes, if you think about it? Or no, no, two part threes. Because Rob Zombie never did a third one. Yeah. That's kind of wacky, right? Well, it's actually going to be a well. I don't know, depending on who you talk to, it's going to be a part three, but it might be considered the real part three. In part, in the original three, will just be erased, which no one really gives. Yeah. Uh, what was the season of the witch? Season right? of the witch. Yeah. Yeah, and that was their attempt to actually make it more. The it was going to be just like a, like a horror anthology sort of thing, where each each additional one was going to be a different sort of story, which would have been cool yeah. for more original content, original ideas. But people wanted Michael Myers. So yes. they gave them what the people wanted. That's so it, when people complain about why does Hollywood reboot and remake things, and that includes me, well, you have you have the audience to thank for that because right. whenever they try to stray away, what do they want? What what do people go see? The same shit. <laughs> That's right. That's right. They get comfortable and they like what they like. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to go. It's hard for them but to go out on a limb, it, but it, it does happen. Yeah. I mean, it. I'm totally, of course, I don't know about you, but I'm totally for, like, we need more fresh ideas in horror. Yes, and 100%. Mm -hmm. In a big way, dude. Because they, even though they just redid, what, The Craft, which mm -hmm. I haven't seen. They just redid um, The Invisible Man, which actually I enjoyed. 
I yeah. actually enjoyed that. I didn't think it was that bad, especially um, I remember I was watching it with my wife. We were watching here at the house and about, I'd say less than halfway through, we paused it, right? Uh, got ourselves something to drink. I said, I think this movie is about to take a turn and go, um, go in a good direction. And then we go back, we hit play, and that's when the guy slices the girl's throat, dude. It's like, yes, it's about time, dude. You know, we're getting to it. So, but yes, of course, The Invisible Man has been done a gazillion times as well. Now, so, do you, fresh do, ideas. Do you have a horror film that's uh, like a guilty pleasure? Hellraiser. Hmm. Love Hellraiser, especially part two, even more than part one. Although part one is iconic and classic, but part two, when they go into hell, oh, I love oh, it. Yeah, that's cool. I absolutely love it. So good, dude. I haven't seen part two in forever, but part one is is still in my mind. And Jesus wept. Man, yes. Clive Barker. Man. Clive Barker is phenomenal. You know what? That wasn't even going to be, that wasn't, that wasn't even the real line. Uh, that line was ad libbed. And Clive was pissed off about that at first, at first, really? but, but it worked so well. It worked yes. well. And Clive, he was like, all right, all right, I'll, I'll let it go. Great, great, great ending line. I mean, great way to finish it off, man. Yeah. Fact, fact. And they're redoing that too, I think. Hellraiser. Of, of course. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah and they're yeah. going to have a female pinhead, which I believe pinhead in the book was female anyway. So um, there's, there's that. Okay. Yeah. Should be cool. Hey, Pinhead's Pinhead's a good character, right? right. Pinhead Queen. Yeah. I'd I'd simp for her, probably. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Mm. Hold on. Yeah, Clyde Barger's phenomenal. I'm surprised he never made um the damnation game into a movie, which was one of his best books. Mm. Absolutely phenomenal, you know. So I'm very surprised he never made that into a, a movie. That would make a very good movie. It's got that whole mystery to it. It's you know, it's got everything. It's definitely a good one. So, and then um, one of my favorite books by Clive Barker is actually Cold Heart Canyon, all right, mm. which is a Hollywood ghost story. And um, it's the only book I've ever read where one of the, the main character like came into my dream. Oh, wow. Yeah, where I had a dream about the main character. So that book always stays on my mind. Like a Freddy Krueger effect for you on there, huh? <laughs> right? Yeah, no, it was good, too. It was good. I love that book. Now, do you have a... What what is your least favorite horror genre? Least favorite horror genre. Wow. For me, mm. we, uh, probably paranormal stuff. It's like, come on. But yeah, yeah, it's been done too many times. Um, I was not into actually paranormal activity. I saw the first movie, didn't see anyone after that either. Um, I'm definitely not a big saw person. The first movie 100 percent absolutely loved it it was phenomenal it was state of the art it was classic it, it was a new twist no one was expecting it and then after that i didn't could not get into them in any way shape or form yeah i mean uh they get kind of redundant after a while it's like i know what to expect there's yeah. these traps how do we get out of these traps more bizarre stuff it's and they killed jigsaw off way too early and now and it became like this <laughs> whole thing of the, like um, them carrying on the plan or something. Yeah. It was so, I think, what was it? Saw four or something. I don't know. It got, it got really, really dumb. Yeah. Really dumb. He had like brain surgery in part three or something or, or four. It could have been something with his brain or something. Yeah. But he was dying. I don't know. I don't yeah. Know. I, I remember. I tuned out. But with the paranormal activity, the first one, the only, I watched it, I was like, man, this is, I looked at my wife, I was like, we could have made this fucking movie. <laughs> I was like, That's we right. could walk around in a green suit. We could, we could, like, and, and pull you around and pull the covers off you while you sleep. We could, we could do that. We could. Nah. Man. It made millions, millions, millions. That's like Blair Witch Project. Remember that came out? Uh, it was um, huge, huge. But they had, did great marketing. That's why, like, when websites first started coming oh, out, yeah. and they they were convincing everybody that it was real. You know, that was the whole point. People were that's, going into the movie that's like it, it was the, real. You know, that's it for the Blair Witch, and then that's one I, I never really understood because when it came out, I was like, I looked at, it, I was like, guys, that's a whole movie. But what I was not paying attention to at the time was the marketing around it and why people really bought yeah. into it being real was because. 
they they got past that fourth wall, man. And hey, there you go. That's that's yeah. clever. That's smart. That's right. Great marketing. No, great there's, marketing. There's a uh, like various like horror podcasts that try to do that. Try to blend um, reality with 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 horror. Like, yeah. is this is this true? What I'm listening to is this actually happening? You know. That's right, and that's from the old. Um, um, when they did War of the Worlds back in the day, and they had um, yeah. the radio um, commercials about aliens are coming. Every, people actually thought that aliens were there. I mean, mm-hmm. that's talk about classic marketing, and look what happened. Phenomenal movie. Mm-hmm. I'm like making money. Okay. Now, to bring this back to the rose, and we're going to wrap up here. Now, once again, remind people where they can get the rose. Yes, definitely. So Amazon, any major um, retailer, Barnes and Noble, um, Books a Million, Indigo, it's all on there. But go to my website, pdoliva.com. You'll see the book there. It'll give you all the links to every um, retailer it's available on. And yeah, that's how to do it. And we're looking at 4.7 stars out of five at, uh, on um, Amazon right now. It looks like it's been received very well. Have, yeah. you, have you received any, any of the feedback? I mean... I have. What, I have. What are they you saying about it? They're loving it. I, even some guy, um, Seth Komeyer, right? He writes for um, it's a website called iHeart Sci-Fi, and he put together an awesome review. I mean, if I could write reviews, I would give his review five stars. Where he was um, comparing each of the characters to like mythology, um, characters and mythology and symbolism, you know. So. Like it's feedback like that that I'm really liking because it's it's stirring up the conversation, getting people interested. But what I love reading the most, and you'll probably see it in there if you look at the Amazon reviews, is one. Um, <laughs> I love you can feel the energy of how people really liked it by just feeling, you know, reading their words. And she's um, what did she say? It was a roller coaster of crazy, something uh. like that. Awesome, absolutely loved it. You know, another um, another reader was like. Um, I am very picky with my van. I love vampire books. I am very picky with my vampire books. This is not a typical vampire book, and it was fantastic in big I words. Like yeah, they let it. So it's like reading stuff like that really, really gets to me. I love reading the reader feedback more than anything. You know, because that's who you're writing it for. You, you know, as a writer, we could say, you know, we all write for ourselves, and that's true. But we want to connect with the reader. We want a lot of people to, you know, read what we're writing and and enjoy it and really have a a good emotional reaction to it. You know, so when you read something like that, reviews like that feels good. It's like puts it into perspective. Yeah, okay, keep going, right? Keep writing more. People are digging it. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. All right, guys, definitely check out the rose. All right, um, PD, Paul, Paul Leva, it's great talking to you. Thank you so much for coming on Hard Talk Radio. Spend some time talking about the Rose, get into uh, dystopia, horror, and horror movies and all that. Um, it's been great having you. Um, been great being here, man. Thank you for having a, me. No problem. And for those, I'm going to end this stream, and I'll fire up one probably about 10 minutes or so. Got to do some some little things and then I'll, I'll play some more final fantasy six on uh real game and chill, which is obviously where this is streaming now. Okay. Anyway. All right. Oliva, thank you so much. You guys, you have a good one. Thank you, my man. Be good.